good day. My name is Dr. Jane Morris and I'm hosting today's webinar from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland. Um, this webinar is going to consist of two speakers, uh, one a psychiatrist and one taking us beyond the psychiatric profession. The topic of the webinar is suicide in the time of COVID. And our first speaker today is Dr. David Hall. Um, Dr. Hall will be known to many of you um, for his eminent career in Dumfries. Um, in 2018, um, David retired from clinical practice uh, and took up a role on the board of the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland. Um, at the same time, uh, he also became a prevention, suicide prevention lead for Scotland and he represents the Royal College of Psychiatrists on the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be here in these extraordinary times. First time I've done a webinar like this, so bear with me if it uh, doesn't sound great, and, and I'll, try, I'll try my best. Um, so yeah, the world has changed dramatically, and certainly uh, the effect on mental health services, on the mental health of the population, and potentially on suicide figures here in the Scotland, the UK, and worldwide is, is immense. So. I'm going to describe to you what the um, situation is as experts um, I, I work with, you know, we are on, on groups with, with me and Rachel, who you've just had mentioned, uh, think may be the impact and what there is we can do about it. So my talk will, will essentially cover what's, what's the likely impact of a global pandemic on suicide uh, and, and in Scotland. Um, where were we in terms of suicide figures in Scotland? where we're in terms of suicide prevention strategy in Scotland and how that's changed to try and mitigate the effects of the pandemic um, and maybe some thoughts about what we as clinicians, if, if I'm speaking to fellow psychiatrists and other mental health, mental health professionals, um, what can we do to try and help this, this situation? So what is the likely effect of the pandemic on suicide rates? Um, I, 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 as part of my um, training, I, was, I, of course, as many of you will, will, will know, um, was taught that potentially at times of national crisis or even international crisis, suicide rates actually can be seen to reduce. So, so traditional thinking was that in wartime or even in other, without being too flippant, you know, national events such as World Cup, suicide and self-harm rates might reduce. Um, certainly the the, the, just to touch on the World Cup issue, uh, studies looking at the suicide rate in France when they hosted and won the World Cup, suicide rates or just self-harm rates in Scotland over the World Cups in the late 70s, did, did seem to show some reduction, perhaps because it was a, a time of national unity. Obviously, in the much more significant and serious times, such as the war time, again, Historically, historically, it was argued that uh, suicide rates perhaps did um, decrease. However, the only, the only study actually which looked at suicide in wartime in Scotland uh, by, by Henderson and Cameron Stark uh, from a few years ago actually showed that at a time of overall decline in suicide, the suicide rate in young men went up. So it was actually more complicated than it seemed. What do we know about pandemics? Well, the suicide rate in America in the Influenza pandemic of 1918-19 certainly appears to have gone up. And during the SARS outbreak uh, in the Far East in Hong Kong, suicide in older people seems to have increased. So, so the, the evidence, perhaps not surprisingly, suggests that suicide rates can be affected by something like a pandemic. Um, but again, the, 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 the alternative view is that when we're, all, when we're all in this together during the crisis, and things like clapping for carers and um, Captain Tom walking for the NHS are the sort of things which try and galvanise that we're all in this together. Um, however, not to sound too cynical, uh, as, as I was reading, and I can't remember the author re quite recently, we may all be in the same storm, trying to weather the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat, sadly. And it's clear, uh, and this is where Duckheim, the French soci sociologist of the late 19th centuries, um, thinking, I think, is, is, is relevant. Um, 
those people who feel more marginalised, not part of society, that sense of anime, that, that sense of being disjointed, is clearly something which can result in um, a greater risk of suicide or death by suicide. Cinema being the opposite, being that we're all in this together. And just to quote what, what Durkheim said, it are suggested that during periods of serious social, economic and political upheaval, which result in quick and extreme changes to society and everyday life, anime and the suicide associated with the anime can occur. I think that pretty much describes what has happened to a lot of people. But again, it certainly suggests, and I wouldn't I, wouldn't, I swore I wouldn't mention Dominic Cummings, but certainly the things which make us feel that we are all in this together are, are important. The things that make us feel like there are, you know, things are not the same for everyone uh, can make things feel worse. Uh, and there is indeed unequivocal evidence that economic recessions, so the pandemic may, if it's like a war, and maybe that's not a very good analogy, but it may be that's a time when we all feel we're all together. But as, as things move on, the economic recession, which is, is inevitable, is undoubtedly potentially associated with a, a, an increase in suicide. So short term, the, the, interestingly, of course, it was, it, was, it was reported in the press wrong where it was, was already evidence of an increase in suicide. Well, it isn't. But the chance that there will be an increase in death by suicide is very, very real. Inequalities magnify risk. And sadly, as, as I'm sure many of you have already read in the papers and seen, uh, there, there's evidence that Although we're, although we're all in this together, uh, some people are affected more than others. And if you are uh, someone from a, a deprived setting or background, your chances of actually getting disease or dying from it are higher. And, uh, as, and as, as well evidenced difference in ethnicity. So this is an, an unequal situation and the inequalities which exist and which will be magnified by the crisis and its effects potentially add to the problem. Um, so the timing and likely extent of any likely rise in suicide rates isn't clear. And mitigation is, of course, potentially possible. So where were we before the pandemic crisis? Well, the Suicide Protection Action Plan produced by the Scottish Government in 2018, Every Life Matters, set out um, a bold, ambitious programme to build on the already promising statistics around suicide in Scotland. Um, aiming for a, a target of a 20% reduction in suicide by 2022 uh, from a 2017 baseline. So this was this strategy was written at the time that uh, we'd seen already a significant decrease of something like 20% in suicide over the um, previous 10 to 15 years. So things were looking positive. And the that action plan uh, had 10 points, I won't go through them in detail, but one of the 10 actions uh, that the Scottish Government laid out included setting up the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group, which myself and Rachel, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, are both members of. So, uh, 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 interesting, exciting and uh, vibrant group of people from across all the agencies, Penumbra, SAMH, the government, the medical profession, or psychiatric profession, GPs, etc. Um, and, and Samaritans, as, as Rachel is chief executive of the Samaritans. Um, and very importantly, the group has, has included um, a, a lived experience panel and members who have experience of family members who've sadly died by suicide. So the, the group focus, focusing on, on local action plans has been set up and exists and has been working on the other key points around training, around a coordinated approach to public awareness about suicide prevention, to build on the Choose Life campaign, and, you'll, and everyone will be hearing soon about a, a new rebranded campaign. Uh, a clear and important focus on uh, supporting those people affected by suicide. And the pilot work already has started in the two years that the group's been in existence around that. A focus on improving crisis support work, and Rachel will talk about the, that, that aspect in more detail. Use of digital innovation to improve suicide prevention. Um, so the positive as well as the negative aspects of, uh, of, of, of uh, the internet. Targeted preventive activity for at-risk groups, including people with mental, with diagnosis, diagnosed mental illness. Um, a very important element, and I'll come on to this in, in more detail in a minute, but ensuring the needs of children and young people are reflected across all the actions. Um, 
and it, everything that is done in terms of suicide prevention work is driven by data. Yeah. And uh, an area that I've, I've been particularly involved in as one of the sponsors is looking at the reviews of suicides as a, as a potential for learning. There's already, as many of you will know, existed a national suicide um, um, review and learning network, which has been revitalised, but of course always focused on, it was a health service based review network, it focused on people who'd been known to mental health services who then died by suicide. Uh, reviews were didn't necessarily take place if, if you didn't if you weren't in touch with mental health services. So there's now a commitment to review every death by suicide, which I think is very important. So th this was this was the action plan which existed. So the pandemic came along and things had to be uh, revisited and uh, reconsidered carefully. In terms of the actual suicide figures, again the other thing which happened after the national strategy had been launched was that the first year's figures um, from 2018, uh, which came out in 2019, were showed a, showed a sad uh, and a really quite significant increase from the previous year. Obviously, as it says in that slide, a single year of data shouldn't be overinterpreted, but it did suggest something was reversing the very positive trend. You know, the overall 19% reduction over the previous 10 years, you know, certainly over that year, things had gone in the wrong direction. And looking carefully at the data and the the um, national leadership group is supported by an academic advisory group, which is led in turn by uh, Rory O'Connor and Stephen Platt, uh, and they help us understand these figures. And it, it suggests that very clearly, the, a large contribution to that increase in that one year was in younger people, 15 to 34 year olds, and with a doubling of suicide rates um, for females, or more than doubling for females in the 15 to 34 year old age group. So although we can't overinterpret one year, prior to the insult of the pandemic, albeit in the back of a number of years of positive news around suicide figures, there was already alarm bells. And the alarm bells are, I would suggest, around what was happening to young people already and what is the impact on young people and their futures of this pandemic and its economic consequences. So, uh, a lot of food for thought there. So the paper which uh, I'm going to allude to now in terms of how we how we as a leadership group in, in suicide prevention uh, in Scotland have looked at the um, taking forward suicide prevention in, the, in, in this new context. The, uh, the COVID-19 Suicide uh, Research Collaborative, again, which Rory O'Connor and Stephen Platt are members of, produced this paper um, thinking around the whole area of how suicide prevention was, was relevant to and how it could be um, used going forward in time in the time of the pandemic. Uh, and again, that's, that, that, that um, table covers the selected and the universal interventions or areas of intervention which they think are particularly important uh, with the overarching use of data and research to understand what is the true impact as we go forward. So a lot of important work and thinking which the, the group, the leadership group has taken uh, and tried to turn into a, a revised set of actions which I'll just describe to you. So in terms of areas of universal intervention, the, the kind of things which will have an effect on how people feel and potentially how suicidal they feel and how many people actually, actually sadly commit or die by suicide, financial stressors, stressors is a key area. So supporting people, the furlough scheme, thinking about uh, um, other, other, you know, all, all the interventions that have been made by government to try and support people will be key. Um, domestic violence, there is, there is evidence sadly that domestic violence figures have gone up already during lockdown. So any interventions to try and support people affected by that will be important. Alcohol consumption, again, early indications that people are thinking in different ways and not always in the best way, uh, and there and they're required to be interventions around that. One which uh, I would highlight, and in terms of the integrated motivational and volitional model that we've talked about in our group, which describes what takes someone from thinking about suicide to committing suicide, feeling trapped. Uh, feeling there's no no other 
way through is, is a key element of that from Professor Connor's work. So the effect of how isolation, loneliness, and indeed the effect of bereavement at this, at this time, um, and, and, and the very, you know, the tragedy of not being able to have a, a funeral, not even to be able to with someone dying, which has been the experience of sadly many people, will undoubtedly potentially have an effect on how people feel and potentially on suicide. And so therefore these areas that require intervention. And just a small aside, I, I'm, a, I'm a trustee with SANS, which is a charity which supports people following neonatal death and stillbirth, and that charity has been overwhelmed in terms of trying to work with people who are enduring such baby loss at this time, making it even more challenging to, to support them. So again, uh, some very relevant potential areas for intervention. Again, access to means uh, as a universal intervention, how uh, easy is it to acquire painkillers or other, um, or to buy quantities of drugs, or insecticide, whatever that people might go on to use to commit suicide. So again, consideration of, of, of restricting uh, the ability to, to, to obtain these items at this time and protecting hotspots, bridges, etc. Uh, media reporting is something which I know that Rachel will speak about again, the very fact that it's been highlighted that suicide had increased when it hadn't, how it's reported, the way it's put across is, is going to be important and we have an impact. So in terms of selected or indicated interventions, the two areas that the, the paper, the Lancet paper that I've mentioned highlight are around people with diagnosed mental illness and what are the implications for, for the services there to support them and those experiencing suicidal crisis, what are the implications and potential interventions that need to be thought about from again services, providers and others who uh, are, are going to be involved there. Uh, so very clearly, and many of the audience, I'm sure, will, who work clinically will have seen a, a dramatic rejigging of how things are done. And that's obviously what needs to happen. Uh, you know, innovative solutions to ensure that people can be supported using technology such as Near Me to allow telemedicine, tele um, methodology to allow people to be seen and assessed and supported. Uh, and I guess this is where, in terms of suicidal crisis, looking across the board to all the agencies involved and trying to work together to provide the best possible and most clear pathway to help and support for people in such crises. So again, the, the areas that are particularly relevant to us are around how crisis helplines uh, and other, other methodologies are, are, are used at this time. And again, Rachel will speak in much more detail about what the, the impact already appears to have been. So government resources initiatives, the, the um, DBI, the Distress Brief Intervention work has been rolled out and, and supported with additional funding uh, and it's seen as obviously one of the important uh, potential initiatives to try and deal with the, the mental health crisis which, uh, is, which we potentially face. So individually, what do we need to do? So speaking as someone who ran a service, was a clinician, um, I think we have to think laterally and think quickly about what, what, is the, what is the nature of the challenge? So preparing, thinking about what's ahead. Um, there's been a rapid rejig in services in my area and elsewhere. What's been good about that? What's been bad about that? What needs to change? What needs to um, stay as, it's, as it's been? So innovation, I think, is, is, is important. Um, Prioritising the important bits, working out what is really uh, having an impact. And you can only do that through using data, really. Um, and you can only do that through collaborating with others. Um, so the idea of reflection on what is having an impact and what is not in, real, in a real time sense is, I think, uh, one way forward. But this might sound familiar to those of you who've been involved in the patient safety programme, because again, the other thing which dominated my career over the last 10 years was leading the, the patient safety programme in Scotland for mental health. And that is about taking, trying to get best practice in place to avoid harm. And it does involve small tests of change, and learning from what you're doing, being prepared to try things differently. And I think that kind of way of working has been exhibited across uh, services in Scotland. So speaking, you know, thinking about mental health services specifically as a psychiatrist, I think the need to do, be innovative, to use data to drive improvement and to be willing to try and improve things on the ground rapidly 
um, is going to be key to responding to the crisis and the challenges that we are facing uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and there's a, a little plug for the hashtag MH Improve Network, which is, which is a network of international network of mental health improvers, uh, and there are many uh, fellow Scots involved in that. Uh, so I would, uh, I'm happy to give you more information about that. But there's a potential area for um, which provides information and examples of how innovation is being carried out as we speak to try and deal with this. So challenging times. Um, uh, but together, hopefully we can try and uh, keep things as, as positive as possible and try and deal with this potential uh, suicide or the potential impact on suicide rates. And at that, I think I'll end my, my talk. Uh, it's over to, uh, back to Jean and then over to Rachel. So thank you. Thank you for an excellent um, presentation, putting suicide into context. Um, we don't have any questions from the membership today, um, so it falls to me to both thank you and ask a question. Um, and I would very much like to ask uh, about not only how can we prevent and manage suicide as psychiatrists, but also how we can support our colleagues uh, when the tragedy does happen, when there is uh, a case of suicide amongst our patients, how can we make sure that as psychiatrists we're not either totally demoralised or terribly avoidant? Um, I think as doctors we regard it as a failure of our professional expertise when a life is lost. Um, but as psychiatrists we're also very attuned uh, to the suffering that goes around the suicide and so we feel a double dose of failure and guilt. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks Jane. Um, I mean, a, a point I could have emphasised more in terms of the prevent, suicide prevention strategy actually thinking about colleagues across the board working in, in, with COVID-19 there's, there's a very real need to offer real-time support to them. Thinking about Specifically, I think the question you were asking about is when a when a tragic suicide occurs, how how do how do we as professionals deal with that? And that's where I think the point I was making about that every suicide should be reviewed. Historically, suicides were, were, were that that review was really about oh well, have we done something wrong? Phew, we haven't. That's great. That's job done. If it becomes the norm that we are reviewing on the basis of doing it together with families and all the other services that might be involved as a matter of course. And it's not just reviewing the ones that we think we may or may, or may not have made a mistake in, if you like. It becomes a different type of exercise, the one which is focused entirely on sharing, understanding and learning. So actually, I think with families reflecting on what has happened and what how things might have gone differently is, is actually very helpful. And I've actually I've, I've reviewed very, very many suicides in the way I've just described, but I've found in the vast majority of occasions working with the family is helpful to the to the clinicians, to the professionals as much as it is to the family. So I think it's a collaborative exercise which can be supportive to everyone. Um, our second speaker today uh, is Rachel Cackett. Um, and Rachel comes to us from out with the uh, confines of the psychiatric profession. In fact, she boasts an extremely diverse and rich background. Um, after studying literature, Rachel began her career in the theatre. Um, and then following a time volunteering for a homeless charity in Edinburgh, uh, she spent four years with Shelter Scotland, ending up as their campaigns manager. She was then public affairs lead for the RVS in Scotland before moving to head up the policy team at the Royal College of Nursing. Um, she worked there for 12 years uh, in various diverse areas, um, but she joined Samaritan as the executive director for Scotland this January, um, which was a really amazing time uh, to then be confronted with the COVID pandemic. Uh, 
Um, so Rachel is now going to talk to us uh, about a, an out of the college view um, on the challenges that face us in the realm of suicide prevention. Thank you for the introduction, Jane. That's very kind. Um, and I'm aware that uh, David in his presentation had suggested that the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group was full of exciting and interesting people. So I feel like the stage is now set for the presentation. Uh, no pressure there. So um, first of all, a big thank you to, to the Royal College of Psychiatrists for inviting me to join this webinar. Um, I'm delighted to, to join you today. And this is my first, also my first recorded webinar. So um, I hope the technology holds up. So today's presentation, um, I'm gonna do a few things. I'm gonna talk you through, first of all, um, the way in which Samaritans has responded to the pandemic and the support services that we have available, which um, you, you may find useful in your own practice. I'm then going to spend some time talking through the research that we have seen coming out through COVID so far and uh, match that or compare it to the data that we're getting from our callers coming into our service. I'm then going to spend a little bit of time, as David said, talking about media guidelines and then the crisis work stream from the NSPLG for which I'm co-sponsor with Penumbra and RCGP. So I'll start off a little with our service. Um, our free helpline, um, and the number is on screen if you don't uh, already know it, um, has remained open 24 seven throughout the crisis uh, and is there free for anyone to call. And we also run an email service. Um, there's about uh, an expected 24 hour turnaround on that one at joe at samaritans.org. People can also still write to us in the post and I've left the free post address up there. And then I wanted just to tell you a little bit about some of the other uh, work that we have. We have our prisoner listening scheme. Um, and that prisoner listener scheme has had to adapt, obviously, to the fact that um, the public health guidance means that we can't go into prisons as we normally would, but we've been working really uh, well with uh, Scottish Prison Service to make sure that those who are imprisoned can still access our service when they need to. We've also launched a new app over the course of COVID. We brought that forward, um, being aware that not everyone would be able to use a phone whilst they're in lockdown, of course, uh, and be able to do so privately. So the app is a web-based app. Again, I've left the uh, web uh, address to, to download that app on the screen. And that app is designed to do a number of things. It allows you to track your mood. Um, it allows you to then uh, get access to evidence-based um, approaches to help your mood. It allows you to monitor over time whether you have triggers to particularly low mood and it allows you to put an emergency plan in place as well. So that app is available freely on our website. We've created a COVID specific resource of web-based support for people, um, either who are feeling in distress or crisis themselves or who were worried about other people. And we're aware that the, the lockdown has obviously meant that people have been quite um, distant from each other, probably haven't seen each other as they normally would. And some people will have concerns about friends and family who are maybe far away or who they can't visit. So those resources are there to help people start conversations. Web chat is a service that we had piloted fairly recently and had planned to roll out. Now, it remains a priority for us to do that, particularly because we think it will give uh, a service access to quite a different client group for us, but we've had to put a pause on that while COVID has been on to try and manage making sure that our core helpline service has remained up and running 24 seven, but that will be coming up, uh, back online, we hope fairly soon. Our face-to-face -face service, which we normally run from our branches, we have 19 branches across Scotland, and we normally have a face to face opportunity for people to drop into those. Obviously, that has been suspended for now, as has our outreach work. And you may or may not know that we do a significant amount of outreach from our branches, everything from talks in schools to work on suicide prevention groups. Um, all of that, again, has had to be suspended at this point in time. But picking up a point that, that particularly Jane was asking um, of David at the end, we have also focused quite heavily on support for key workers and we're part of a joint campaign called Our Frontline. If you put that into Google, you'll find the website. That's a brand new piece of work. 
that we've done in collaboration with MIND, with Hospice UK and with Shout, who provide a text based service uh, for those in crisis. And that's supported by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's foundation to support all frontline workers, so uh, health and social care staff, delivery drivers, supermarket workers. That website has got resources available to, to everyone to try and support them through what's been a particularly difficult time. So I wanted to be able to give you a, a shape of the sorts of services that we are currently offering and again, put that information up so that it's available to you to use. So what's this been looking like for us through the pandemic? Well, the first thing is to say that all of our work on prevention has not gone away. So as David said, we're members of the NSPLG together. Um, I hope you've seen the Clear Your Head website. We're a core partner to that um, and have worked very closely with the Scottish Government on its COVID and mental health planning group, which John also sits on um, from Royal College of Psychiatrists to help us create a shape to the immediate response for the population mental health issues that were arising, but also to do the longer term planning that David has also spoken about for how we come out of this pandemic and to how we prepare for the sorts of effect this may well have on people in the future. I said I was going to tell you a little bit more about our caller insights and I want to, to give you an overview first of all of what we've found on our line. So in the first 13 weeks of lockdown we provided emotional support around 645,000 times. Now that's across the entire UK. We run our service as a UK wide service because that means that we can keep our, our lines running 24 seven by spreading the load through our branches across the UK. Um, that equates to about 7,000 times a day that we will be supporting people. And what we're finding is that the data suggesting about one in three callers are talking about COVID. But when we've surveyed our volunteers and what you're about to see for this presentation is the results in part of a couple of surveys that we've run since March that's taken in views from about 3,300 volunteers, is that COVID may not be mentioned, but it's present in almost all calls. We're finding that our callers are generally expressing more anxiety and more distress than before COVID, and that's increased as lockdown has continued. And a few volunteers have spoken about being about callers being concerned about being overheard and ending calls abruptly, and an increase in email contacts, perhaps suggesting that it's really hard for people to make private confidential phone calls when they're in lockdown at home with small children, at home with partners, just finding space can be very difficult. And we've also seen an increase in first time callers, people in prison or people just wanting to talk and a sense of isolation, which we'll come on to shortly. The next few slides uh, take a, a few themes. Um, look at what the research has told us so far from uh, since COVID has begun and then talks a little bit about what we've seen through our volunteers. So about one in 10 adults uh, reported suicidal thoughts during the first week of lockdown. I've got a small reference in the bottle at bottom of the slide, but the full references are available in the notes pages of the slides. And that people with a mental health diagnosis have been three times more likely to have suicidal thoughts. Self-harm seems to have remained stable, um, even as the lockdown has been relaxed. Um, but those with a mental diagnosed mental health condition are approximately three times more likely to self-harm or attempt suicide. So that's where we are now. What our volunteers are telling us from our surveys that their, their sense is that callers are not any more or less suicidal than they were before the pandemic. Of course, remembering um, Though we offer support uh, for people who are not feeling suicidal, um, many people who are will be our callers. But callers who discuss suicide are uh, talking of feelings of isolation, anxiety and hopelessness. And again, that links to what David was telling you uh, in the presentation before. And as the lockdowns continues, that feeling of entrapment, which is really important, has come up as well and not seeing an end to this. Anxiety and loneliness. Um, during the first week of lockdown, about half the population experienced high levels of anxiety. Uh, as it's eased, that's gone to about four in 10, though more prominent among women. And around one in three UK adults' well-being being affected by loneliness and 50% of young people feeling that well-being was affected. What our volunteers are telling us, as I've already said, people are more anxious and more distressed. We've seen an increase in the frequency of conversations around isolation. And callers seem to be more distressed about loneliness and isolation as the lockdown has gone on. 
certain groups have been more affected like older people but as we've gone on we've seen more calls from young people concerned about separation and we're also seeing some callers worried about the new rules of interaction as lockdown eases and as i said before the increase in calls where people are just wanting to talk to someone have have gone up relationship so again david had mentioned this uh, in terms of domestic violence refuge has registered a 25 percent increase in calls and in london the met uh, had a significant increase in the number of domestic abuse incidents what we are seeing is there is heightened anxiety from callers about family and that's leveled off a bit as lockdown has gone on um, that's not always about strife within the family sometimes that's about health issues so Early on, more callers were concerned about contracting the virus, whereas as we've gone on, there's been particular concerns about the financial impact on family. Some callers have been concerned about being separated from loved ones, and there's been worries about having vulnerable family members who are far away, may not even be up the road, but you can't go and see them even though you want to care. That's been a particular concern. Certainly the extended nature of lockdown has exacerbated household tension, and we're seeing an increase in calls from young people frustrated at living with parents and parents who are reporting difficulties with homeschooling. So there's a whole bag of issues in there around relationships that are bubbling away as lockdown has continued. In terms of people with a mental health diagnosis, um, people with a mental health diagnosis have consistently reported feeling more lonely and three quarters of people with severe mental illness has felt that mental health has got worse as a result of the pandemic, according to some work done by Rethink. Now, obviously, we're not talking necessarily about um, diagnosable mental illness. We, we don't ask those questions. But in terms of people who've identified as, themselves as having an existing mental health condition, we're seeing an increase in frequency of conversations about callers, mental health conditions being being worse and the lack of access to support. And that lack of access has become a major theme um, and causing callers increasing levels of distress. And as lockdown has eased, we've heard additional reports of insufficient and adequate support and some using Samaritans as an alternative to maybe those more formal services that they've been used to. Callers appear to be increasingly distressed about their mental health problems. Uh, many are talking about the loss of their usual coping strategies and support networks. Some have struggled to get a routine in and have, have slid back into things that have, uh, are not doing them well. Um, in the first month, we did hear people talking about positive changes um, because of that sense that, that David was talking about earlier um, uh, from his wartime examples of all being in the same boat. But our volunteers are telling us that this seems to have dwindled as the, restru as the restrictions have continued. I've put specific slides in around finance and David was talking about the evidence around economic impact and economic deprivation uh, and economic recession on suicide rates in the past. Um, you can't get away from the headlines about the, the impact of this um, at this point in time and also the projected impact of what is coming. So a third of adults um, in full time employment were worried about losing their job in some work the Mental Health Foundation had done. And the ONS stats that I've put up here around benefit claims, furlough and the particular Im impact on young people um, on, on being furloughed are pretty stark. In terms of our callers, we're certainly hearing the same. An increase in frequency of conversation, heightened anxiety about finance and unemployment, which has stabilised. But in the beginning lockdown um, of lockdown, callers were worried about accessing essentials. And there are common themes around losing jobs, losing business, being furloughed. And as time has gone on, volunteers are reporting an increase in calls from people for whom those worries have actually materialised. And then we move into issues around not paying rent, being able to pay rent, financial support from the government not being an, enough and a fear of homelessness. And some callers are worried about the pressure to go back to work as lockdown starts to ease. So that's some of how our caller information, uh, uh, particularly from surveys from our volunteers and the evidence that we're beginning to see emerge, uh, match and, and complement each other.
We're also doing a lot at the moment to add to the research base. So at a UK level, we're working with Glasgow University and SAMH uh, to, to, to run a study of around 3000 people who will be followed up through the pandemic to understand the ongoing impact. Alongside that, Scottish Government have commissioned the same partners to do a specific piece of work in Scotland and our ongoing work into our own caller insights um, will be shared with the NSPLG to help um, determine that response and to make sure we're using the best data that we can. I want to now focus on two areas, the first being responsible media reporting and David uh, in his presentation had mentioned the now infamous claim um, around a 200% increase in suicides under lockdown. Uh, we don't know where this came from, it is not true, but what is very interesting that according to the BBC there were 42,000 hits on this in the first 10 hours of it going viral and if only some of the actual uh, tr true facts could get that sort of traction we'd probably be in a much better position. Certainly Samaritans did a lot of work to go and try and counteract that claim because as David said there is at this stage no evidence of an increase in suicide. This is bread and butter work for Samaritans. We um, produce media guidelines um, which are circulated to media outlets across the UK, putting in best practice tips around how to report on suicide safely uh, and if nothing else to try and avoid uh, copycat, but to issues like um, not sensationalising, not oversimplifying, reasons for suicide. If you haven't seen these, I would suggest you go onto our website and take a look. For anyone who posts on social media, for anyone who was involved in any form of media uh, exposure around suicide and self-harm, there are some great hints and tips in here on how to do that safely. But we have a, an active monitoring of the media and do work with the media very actively where we are concerned about responsible reporting or indeed to support responsible reporting but also work with um, uh, TV producers for example where they are wanting to include a storyline around suicide we often in behind the scenes advising on that. As David said I'm one of the sponsors of the national work on crisis uh, and that remains a particular priority as we prepare for the emergence from the pandemic. And the focus of that work at this point in time is very much on the point of suicidal crisis. Uh, we're aware there's an important issue about how many people reach that point. And there is also an important point about how many people go through like a revolving door of going through crisis and out into what well, into service uh, to support or indeed not into services to support and end up back in suicidal crisis repeatedly. But our initial work is on the point of suicidal crisis and we've expedited that work to give recommendations to shape that post COVID landscape. We're being supported by the academic advisory group and have a survey which has uh, which is going out at the moment to uh, people from a number of different sectors to help us come up with some recommendations for the autumn for what those, uh, what those services could and should look like and what we have learned through COVID about how to deal with crisis. And it links to the other priority within the NSPLG to get better real-time data on suicide and self-harm. So that's the conclusion of my presentation for today. I hope that's given you a, a, a flavour of Samaritans, our response to the crisis, uh, uh, what, what we're hearing in terms of themes from our callers and how that is uh, pretty much mirroring what we're hearing from other research and some of the priorities for us around media reporting and suicidal crisis. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Rachel, for a, another most enlivening and um, thought provoking presentation. As I listened to you, I thought of my own particular interest in the mental health of universities and student populations. And whilst everything you said uh, reminded me of their predicament, I wonder if I could ask you for a particular comment um, on how suicide and suicide prevention interventions need to be modified to their particular needs. Well, I think some of the um you're right, I haven't specifically spoken about that group and I think the research that's starting to come out about the impact of this on the mental health and well-being of both children and young people 
is is showing that there is an awful lot to do. We have a, a member of the NSPLG who has a very particular interest in uh, students and the impact of students and the prevention required around students. Good. Um, well, thank you again, Rachel, for a very helpful answer. Um, and I'd like to thank you again in the absence of audible applause um, for your contribution. Before we close, I would also like to ask both you and David um, whether each of you could think about how we as the psychiatric profession uh, can best work together uh, and also with other agencies uh, in order to take further the cause of suicide prevention in Scotland and particularly uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic in mind. Would you like to go first, perhaps, Rachel? Well, I, f I guess I feel very aware, I'm not sure if I should go first, given that David represents the college on the NSPLG. And I think um, from the moment I walked into the NSPLG for the first time and sat next to David in the room at my first meeting back in January, and we began a conversation, I think the important thing is that suicide prevention takes all of us whatever our particular focus, whether we are clinicians working with people with significant severe mental illness, um, whether we're a police officer on the street or whether we're a friend who's concerned about somebody. Um, my sense is within suicide prevention, it almost doesn't matter where we are. The responsibility is on all of us to do what we can within our individual sector. So I think the fact that you are represented um, on the NSPLG so vociferously by by David um, that I sit with John on the the national mental health and COVID planning group within Scottish government. The important thing is that each of those sectors has its voice. Um, my sense is that the college has a very strong voice in this and that the issues that you face with the people that you work with and their families is being presented incredibly strongly. Um, I think the, the 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 collaborative nature of that is what matters. That I, I do think that thinking about suicide prevention, my kind of understanding of, of my role as a clinician and you know over the years has expanded. And I think as as it's become clearer that you can't provide mental health services in any kind of standalone way. And it took me many years to work this out. But actually, in a local, at a local level, understanding what's really what's really available, what other agencies are around, and working in a truly collaborative way is the best way to provide a service. And it's certainly the best way to to provide a service which extends to some of the people that psychiatrists might say, well, that's not really, your, your problem really doesn't you know, meet the criteria for for the kind of skills that I have. But knowing where people can go for help, so I think it's the onus is on on the membership and psychiatrists to be, to really understand where we sit professionally amongst all the other partners. And what I said earlier about suicide reviews, actually our, our, our ability to provide an insight and to contribute to the discussion and the learning when these tragedies occur alongside others, even 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 even, even with someone who we've not had any dealings with. So I think being part of the multi-agency response to suicide when it occurs and indeed to the preventative work which is ongoing is, is important. So it's one of the broader areas that psychiatrists need to be involved in. So if, if psychiatrists that are watching, I think we have a very important potential role working with others uh, you know, united to prevent suicide. Well, thank you both for your thoughts. Thank you yet again for two memorable presentations. Um, I would like to thank you as speakers on this webinar. I'd also like to convey our thanks to those people behind the scenes who've put together a series of webinars at this time when live conferences sadly cannot be. And I'd th like also to thank everybody who signed up to this webinar, uh, to you as members, for taking the trouble to take time out of your very busy clinical demands um, and for making sure that you're learning uh, in the current climate. So thank you very much to everybody and we look forward to welcoming you to more learning webinars. <laughs>